Today's agenda includes presentations from Hassan El Khoury, President and CEO, and Thad Trent, Chief Financial Officer, followed by a Q&A. Throughout this presentation, the company may make forward-looking statements. In addition, we will be referring throughout the presentation to certain non-GAAP financial metrics with respect to our company. We ask you to please refer to the forward-looking statements disclaimer, as well as the GAAP, non-GAAP reconciliations that have been provided in the presentation materials posted to our website at www.onsemi.com in the Investors Relations section. At Onsemi, we're driving disruptive innovation with our intelligent power and sensing technologies to build a better future like making our energy infrastructure more efficient and sustainable to support rapidly evolving changes in power production, distribution, and consumption. Redefining industrial automation and manufacturing by making every part of the factory more power efficient and enabling high frame rates that capture the most detailed images at extreme speeds. Accelerating the EV revolution with game-changing silicon carbide technology that charges cars faster, extends driving range, and enhances performance. Making cars safer with intelligent sensing HDR technology that can detect pedestrians, cars, and obstacles in all conditions, from sunlight to moonlight. Transforming cloud and 5G infrastructure with the world's most efficient power solutions. And innovating to enhance our health and well-being while making our buildings and homes more connected, more efficient, and more secure. By combining our manufacturing excellence and the industry's most advanced packaging technology with our innovative solutions, our teams are not only striving to make our world a better place, we are exploring other worlds as well. On Semi, intelligent technology, better future. Very refreshing. <laughs> well, first off, uh, thank you all for coming. It is uh, the next refreshing thing is to having everybody here in person. Uh, so I thank you and I welcome you. We have a very exciting uh, day, a few hours. Uh, I did bring backup. Obviously, my team is my main backup. Uh, however, I did bring backup here on stage. Uh, Thad will uh, uh, present uh, afterwards on the financials. But more importantly, I brought some, uh, some of our customers to back me up. So you'll see uh, them covering it. Uh, let's start with what's going on in the world. Uh, we are driving technology in, in the world. However, that technology is being driven by something much higher. You've seen it all in the news. The governments are asking for it. Employees are actually demanding it. We have companies are investing in it, uh, just like we are. And then shareholders are requiring it. It is about the sustainability and our responsibility of what we need to do. Those are a lot of the drivers of what needs to happen. But more importantly, it's just the right thing for us to do. It is what we should be investing in, and more importantly, what our investments should enable our customers to do. But what does that translate as far as the markets that we all hear about? If you look at the greenhouse gas trend, two thirds are from industrial and automotive. The biggest segments and the biggest markets that we also target. And if you look at and you spread it over a lot of the sub-markets, you will realize that a lot of these markets that are growing, that we all are excited about, that's going to drive the future of electronics and semiconductor content, they are all spread. It's an exciting arena, but how could a company like Aunt Semi tackle all of these and maximize the value we bring in without getting 
all over the place. You know, you hear me a lot talk about focus, focus, focus. How do you focus when there are so many opportunities out there? The difficulty of what not to do anymore. But there's one thing common to all of them. And that commonality is the sustainability. So if you abstract yourself from just the application and the market and you look at what is driving that growth? What is the growth coming from? Where are companies investing in their systems? And where are the companies investing in their capital? And what you will find is what's driving it is the same theme that you see in the headlines, and that's the sustainability. And if you look at the sustainability, there are two themes that come out that relate to what we do every day. And that's the power and sensing theme. So from a, all of these common markets, you have the power as the new frontier. Complexity adds power requirement. Com compute adds power requirement. The climate and the sustainability drive is what's driving the power need, but more importantly, the innovation in power efficiency. And when you look at the auto and industrial, they both drive that same efficiency in two different areas, where industrial is leading in order for automotive to achieve the efficiencies they need. And on the sensing side, you'll see the same commonality, where the industrial automation, the efficiency, in order to keep up with that demand that we are all excited about, you need to drive that efficiency from the sensing side in order to be able to properly and efficiently control the power side. And innovative companies that come up with these disruptive technologies with the strong ecosystem are the companies that are going to win. That's the focus. That's how you bring those mega trends. You bring all of the headlines across all these markets and you synthesize them to power and sensing. And they're synergistic. One will drive the other. In order to achieve the efficiency of a power system, you need to be able to sense real time what that power system is trying to achieve and optimize it in order to deliver on that efficiency. And they go hand in hand. They're synergistic goals because you need the efficiency of power and the efficiency and the sensing on the automation, on the factory automation side, because factories are what's going to build and efficiently deploy the automotive subsystems that we all need from a content perspective in order to drive that and keep up with that demand and more and more of the content going into these vehicles. And the value that this will bring is the value from the efficiency of it. When you drive efficiency, customers will value that. And it's not just the value when I talk about monetary value, although we're all here and it's important, but they value because it helped them achieve that higher mission that drove that market that they're participating and winning in. And when we do that efficiently in the biggest drivers of automotive and industrial, what you will get is that same pull from the synergistic markets that we see. That's how we take a complex market with a lot of growth drivers and you maximize your exposure to these drivers by focusing on power and sensing. And that is the winning combination. That's how you drive the growth, through power and through sensing. But more importantly, the growth that they drive across of these markets. Now you may see, okay, how does that map to it? You add the intelligence in order to achieve that efficiency. I'll simplify and say, not anybody, but you could argue, well, you can make a power switch, and some companies do. But how do you get the intelligent power switch? That's where the cross-functionality of the technology that you apply, where you take the breadth of it, you focus it, and you extract that value that customer need. And when you look at it now, the same markets but you look at it from a technology perspective versus just the mecha trend at face value of the market, you would realize that it maps exactly one-to-one -to, -one to the market that are growing faster than the semiconductor market. And that's how you synthesize a complex story 
into a very achievable and execution story. But more importantly, it is not a small market. We are talking about $74 billion growing faster than the rest of the market. And that is why I personally come to work every day, is to be able to achieve that and see that achievement translate into value created for customers and subsequently value created for our shareholders. Now we could look at it in a different way when I harp on efficiency and that's what it takes to win. Everybody needs to make trade-offs. You know, I started the whole thing with, you gotta make some trade-offs on what markets do you go after and what markets you don't go after. But if I put myself in the customer's shoes, the trade-off here is, is a different type of trade-off. We trade off cost, efficiency, and then the weight or form factor, depending on the application. But what does that mean on a power trade-off? You want to hit a cost target? Sure. You can get low efficiency power products. You'll hit the target. But what does that mean for the system when your products that are the baseline of, a, of your end goal are less efficient? You lose that power coefficient. You lose that translation from battery to drivetrain. And that kills your range if you're making an electric vehicle. Electric vehicle with a heightened range anxiety is not valuable to consumers like us. And therefore, you add the battery. So that trade-off is a losing proposition. You can save costs on efficiency, but you're going to pay for it for battery. For an EV, eh, I don't know. I'd rather get none of these than to make a trade-off. And on the sensing, is the same thing. You know, commercial sensors, non-automotive, just commercial sensors are made for different use cases. Because I know the use cases in automotive are very, very different. Night driving, front sun driving. Now we have the luxury of grabbing a, our sunglasses and putting them on or putting the visor down. What are you gonna do with the car? other than put it in reverse so the camera is not blinded. You have to be able to see those. Those are use cases that are not available in consumer products. The same thing with the sensing. So how do you offset that? You add cost. You add multiple cameras, different angle cameras, so one doesn't get blinded by the other, and so on and so forth. You drive your cost. You drive efficiency down, therefore. Now what do I see, what do the engineering communities at On Semi see? They see the opportunity. We see the opportunity through innovation to give customers the power of the and. We wanna give cost and efficiencies and weight. By having efficient technologies, intelligent power technologies, you get the efficiency that you require. And when you get the efficiency you require, you are going to get it in a compact footprint. Why? Because you don't need to double up on the electronics. You get the form factor. And when you get the form factor and you have the efficiency, you get the range. And, and, and. That's how customers win the range battle. That's how customers win the content battle, by not having to do these trade-offs. And that's the technology capability that we drive within those markets. And the same applies on the sensors. When you look at sensing and the intelligence of sensing and the integration, the feature integration and I'll talk a little bit more detail about the features that are required in order to achieve the optimal result of all of these use cases. That today, I will tell you, there's not a single provider or single solution other than on-semi sensing solutions that are able to provide 
the solution for all of these without the trade-off of safety. And I will tell you, autonomous cars, the last place you want to have a trade-off is in safety, because that will gate the adoption. Through integration and in implementing intelligent technologies is how we will be accelerating not only the adoption of these features, but the comfort of us as end users will have while deploying those features. And that is our mission for both power and sensing. Hello, my name is Gary Hickok. I am a senior vice president at NVIDIA. I think the relationship between OnSemi and NVIDIA has been a long one. And that partnership has allowed it to be strong. And that strength and that uh, transparency of relationship has been great in serving customers we have had in the past, as well as innovating on in products in the future and providing new technologies to market needs. The number one thing we always look for is performance in a solution. That solution needs to be efficient, needs to be kind of the best of class in the market. One of the key problems that NVIDIA was trying to solve is how to create an amazing computing platform for autonomous vehicles, which includes both automotive, robotics, uh, larger transportation. NVIDIA chose on Semi, first of all, because of a long-term relationship, a long-term commitment for automotive and high quality type platforms. On Semi partnered with us in several different parts of our solution, including our drive computers, so on board, and including in our Hyperion automobiles, providing sensors, cameras for those vehicles. On Semi provided a unique solution by being one of the first to market with eight megapixel sensors, that were of high enough quality to be used in the automotive industry. Autonomous vehicles powered by an amazing platform, an efficient platform, will help the world both conserve energy, help save lives as they improve safety, and, and provide better convenience. I enjoy working with many of the individuals at On Semi. They, they have the same um, professional characters, the same professional high standards that allow us to be uh, effective in communication, clear when there's issues that need to be solved, and then productively getting something done quickly. Using the co combined solution of OnSemi and NVIDIA, the customer is going to have a safer vehicle with better perception and a more efficient vehicle in terms of battery life and power consumption. Efficiency is key and being able to solve these real life problems for our customers and our customers' customers is what you need to win. However, there is interlocking between all of these markets. If you think about the ecosystem that is evolving today, you need to take a step back away from just the auto or just the industrial or charging or infrastructure. If you take a step back, one is throttled or gated by the other. If we are not able to generate the energy required to fuel the batteries and to fuel the electric vehicle revolution, the electric vehicle revolution adoption will not happen. If we are not able to enable the charging infrastructure, you will not be able to push the boundary and the adoption and the ramp that drives the content into the electric vehicles. If we are not able to get the efficiency through power and sensing that is required to run highly capable and high throughput manufacturing sites, all end products will not come out as efficient as we need. And if you're not able to power the complexity and the increasing power demand of the 5G and cloud infrastructure, not just automotive and industrial, but a lot of other markets, will not be able to grow as we see. These are the things where the balance in an ecosystem is required and that balance needs to be struck through the intelligent power and sensing. And that is the key to unlocking the value that all projections that we all enjoy, and to be honest with you, all of us are quoting, are gonna happen. Let me start with the 5G and cloud. Talk about the complexity, but more importantly, the power density. There's more and more density 
of traffic, more and more density of storage, and therefore more and more density of power. What is the solution if you don't have power efficiency? Well, there's one simple solution. Double up on the building. Spread it all out. Don't have it dense. Well, we all know that's not a, a solution that's viable, and therefore that solution will gate the growth. That complexity is what's going to drive the need for innovation and the need for a new generation of power products that we do here. And not only do we do it, we support customers who are driving that evolution down through the supply chain and enabling that 5G deployment, that smart factories and the e-mobility and consumer product that all need and drive through it. We cannot have a bottleneck because of power. And that is the main anchor of growth we have in the 5G. And that's the push. My name is Tammy Couture at Nokia. I'm Vice President of Technology Development. Nokia and OnSemi have been working for decades together, bringing to our customers designs that meet the customer's needs. The global manufacturing strategy that OnSemi has is perfect for our alignment in bringing products to the customer in a timely manner. A key attribute for a supplier, and one that OnSemi shows, is honesty and transparency. Otherwise, we can't solve our problems together. Nokia and OnSemi have a strategic partner relationship where we have bi-directional ability for technical teams and management teams to work together on our goals for the future. I feel that OnSemi's commitment to being industry leading in their product designs is what makes them an enabler for our product designs. Customer satisfaction is key to all of us. There's a couple areas that uh, really we need to focus on together. One is uh, reducing power consumption. Power consumption is key for our customers, for our environment, for our children, and so on. On Semi has clearly shown their importance of innovation in power consumption domain. And that clearly aligns with Nokia's key initiative to reduce emissions by 50% by the year of 2030. The biggest thing that any company can do is figuring out how do we have less impact on the globe? How do we use less of the natural resources? And for infrastructure, power consumption is the key. Products become orders of magnitude more complicated, but they can't use orders of magnitude more electricity and more resources uh, from the globe. Nokia's aspiration is to design products that leave the world in a better place for our children and our children's children. And on semi is part of that solution. Orders of magnitude more complex, but they cannot use order of magnitude more power. It is not a solution and it is not a formula that is winning. And if we can't get there, we are not able to support the market growth that we're able to and is right in front of us. And that is how we win, by being able to provide these, by pushing the boundary of power, pushing the boundary of technology, pushing the boundary of packaging, because all of these have to work together in order for us to talk about efficient, intelligent solutions that solve customer problems. And I said I was going to bring back up. You didn't hear it from me. You heard it from them. And that's how they vote. They vote with their product selection. The same thing happens on the other markets. Part of that ecosystem. When you talk about factory automation, we talk about energy infrastructure and, and charging. All of them are related from generation of power to distribution of power. If we're not able to get that power efficiently to the end nodes, i.e. electric vehicles, how many of us will buy an electric vehicle if you can, within range, get a charging station? And more importantly, efficient charging station. From factory automation, there's more and more increase of throughput that is required in order for efficiency to get on the footprint. There's more and more automation and artificial intelligence and machine learning in order to get that throughput. The same 
power density that is required in order to harness the natural resources, whether it's solar or wind. Having that efficiency, that compact, that power density through intelligent power is key to unlocking the capability and maximizing the little wind burst that happens here or a little sun that shows up in between the trees when we're at home. Efficiency matters. And energy storage is the boundary that's going to bridge that to the next level. And that's all content. And more importantly, the deployment or the delivery of the content as it relates to electric vehicles, where you can fill up gas in five minutes. You can't take three days to get to a full charge to full capacity. 30 and 20 minutes are the targets now and those we keep pushing the boundary and you are not able to get to those unless throughout we get that efficiency. And the throughput matters when it comes to sensing. I'll take a minute here to explain what these two are. It's exactly the same image. It's a rotating barcode, 2D and well, one dimensional and two dimensional barcode. Same image, same speed. One is global shutter and one is a rolling shutter. Let me talk about the trade-off for a second. Obviously we do global shutter, <laughs> first off. <laughs> but if you have those cameras and you're running throughput, how do you think you can get the throughput to read a undistorted image on a line when you're inspecting your product without any errors? Well, the only way is you slow down the line. So you catch up and you make this picture look flattish. Or you can go to Global Shutter in a tiny package. For some of you who are sitting in the back, if you didn't notice, I guess it's on this side, in a tiny package. Feature packed, high resolution, efficient integration of smart sensing is the only way you can get the throughput and you are able to maximize the output of any factory. In cars, global shutter is the only way you can look at a driver and catch a blink. I know I, it seems like I catch the blink with any camera every time I take a picture, I only get blinking people. But to get the blink, and it's not just that somebody blink, how fast you're blinking is how alert you are. The faster you blink, you're alert. The car is fine. If you're blinking, I'll just close my eyes for two seconds. You're tired. The car will alert you. The difference between the two and the mismatch between the two is life or death. Who wants that trade-off in safety? You don't. But you want both. You want the and of all of them. And therefore, with the content growth, that is being driven in these applications. When we look about, you know, three to 10,000 per factory, just the sprawling of the factory from robots to robot, from assembly robots to logistics robot, like you saw in the video earlier, for the inverter to generate the power, where you need to be able to provide both silicon base, IGBT, and silicon carbide in order to get that maximum power, you need both. One is not enough. We started with IGBT, we still do IGBT. We're complementing our power position with silicon carbide because from an ecosystem perspective, silicon carbide is how you're going to get to charge a car in 20 to 30 minutes. But that's the ecosystem that we need to be able to power in order to get that. Content, 2,000 to 4,000 per charger. Now you, you've all known the, the growth targets and how many units and so on. Just drive in your neighborhood, figure out how many gas stations, how many pumps there are, and figure out in your neighborhood how much on semi content will be driven in your neighborhood. Because that's what we need. We need chargers everywhere in order for cars and electric vehicles to be everywhere. Range anxiety is real and we help customers, both on the infrastructure and the automakers, to remove that anxiety. 
Which takes me to the automotive evolution that has been fueled by all of these capabilities. Advanced safety is not new. We've been talking about it for, for, well, I know I have. I've been in automotive my whole career. We've been talking about automotive safety incrementally. It's taken step functions. Governments are requiring it. You want to sell a vehicle. You want to put a vehicle on the road. There are minimum levels of safety that you need to have. And I will tell you, those minimum levels of safety were non-existent 10 years ago, and now they are required. That is driving a content evolution if you're able to solve the problem, which we are. Systems must be able to deliver on the ASOL D, the highest automotive safety integrity level. That highest level is D. You cannot achieve it with a single product. We have the best cameras in the world. They're capable. We have the best PMIX and power subsystems in the world. They're capable. The system is only capable when you put our PMIC and our image sensor together. It's not optional if you want to be able to detect that. My name is Jing Xiang Xiao. People also call me Professor X. I'm the CEO and founder of AutoX. AutoX's long-term mission is to really democratize autonomy to make self-driving cars become part of people's daily life in China, also around the world. AutoX just released our Dream 5 solution. This is the first and right now the only truly fully driverless robot taxi solution in China. We're very happy to have the Unsemi product as part of the Dream 5 solution. We need to have very high resolution camera sensing and lidar sensing, even under very extreme weather condition and lighting condition. This is a very important part to help our robot taxi to see the world clearly so that we can drive safely. We have 28 8 megapixel cameras and we're also equipped with a lot of lidar. Compared to our generation 3 system, which is 2 megapixel cameras, we can actually increase the resolution by 4 times. This means the perception range will go. Uh, twice as long as the previous generation. With the Unsemi solution on our car, now we can see much further away with a longer perception range, we can see more accurately. All these are very crucial for uh, reliable self-driving capability. Onsemi is a really a very important provider for our solution, and we, mostly because of the high resolution, high dynamic range, high quality of the sensors, as well as the very well-known production capability and in particular, meeting automotive grade are super important in our application. We can really use this to improve our transportation efficiency, also avoid traffic accidents. With a robust, better solution, a very reliable self-driving technology, we can avoid those accidents and save a lot of lives. With the AutoX fully dri driverless robot taxi, we can actually reduce the need for people to purchase private vehicles because the ride sharing are more and more convenient and safer, cleaner. This can actually provide a very great benefit to contribute to the global society as well. We're glad that Ansemi and AutoX could be a long-term partner for this global mission. Not about you, but when I get into a taxi that doesn't have a driver, I feel way better when I know that they're a customer of ours <laughs> because I know where the cameras came from and I know we're gonna see everything clearly and detect every failure, both on the image and the power. And that is the winning combination. Think about it, 4,000 different failure modes that need to be detected. And I'm not saying detected so you can shut down the car, it's detected and be overcome while not changing the integrity of the system. And that is the automotive safety. So it is, you know, Sure, it sounds like a marketing campaign. ASOL D sounds very fancy. But you have to be able to detect and show on a system level that the integrity of the system has not been compromised. Whether it's cyber or whether it's a pixel, a single pixel on an 8 megapixel camera cannot fail. That's the level. Because perception is key. When you don't have a driver, the car is your eyes. 
I don't want to sit in a car that's driverless and not be able to do work or just hold on to the, everybody's got a name for it, so I won't say it, but the bar. That's the comfort. We have more coverage than anybody out there. And it's the best class vision beyond what a human can see. And the numbers don't lie. Our capability today and our customers today and the number of cars on the road on semi is saving nine lives per hour. That is our responsibility and that is our pride to be able to do that through technology. So if you look at what does it mean, that's the eight megapixel Professor X was talking about. Why does it matter? Because we need to be able to detect a car out in the distance with the brake lights on, a boulder, that boulder is a foot, 185 meters in broad daylight. Now you may say, okay, what if I tell you we need to be able to detect the same thing? And oh, by the way, the pedestrian forgot about him or her. 185 at night with the same camera, same car, with just your headlights. That high dynamic range is life or death, not just for the driver, but for the, for the pedestrian. Side by side is no trade-off. Side by side is where efficiency, side by side is where intelligent sensing happens, and side by side is the feature integration that I'm talking about. But there are other cases where visually, how do you resolve? Visually meaning, what about the things that the eye cannot see? When I talk about 100 times better than what you and I see, we can argue 15-20 vision, 20-20 vision, glasses, no, it doesn't matter. Take the 100, I'll give you credit, 80 times. Still, 80 times better. 100 times better than the vision. That's all great. What if you can't see it? Fog or smoke is when we cannot see. Forget about autonomous driving. Here's a car driving into a smoky patch. The greater image is what the computer sees. I just lost visibility of the car. I'm driving behind it. I don't see the car. I'm coming up to it. I need my autonomous vehicle to see even what I don't see. Now we've seen some of those cars with the big rotating tower. Okay, I don't know about you, but I like cars without a big rotating tower. Uh, and we solved that problem. If we see in 3D and we can adjust, then why does the car not see in 3D? Why does LiDAR have to be so cumbersome? Why does safety cost weight, it costs inefficiencies, and it costs cool car to look not so cool. You have to be able to solve that problem and we solve it with our technology, with the LiDAR. This little thing solves that perception of what we cannot see. Sensing and power and powerful packages that show integration are the only way we as technology providers do not gate the potential opportunity that the markets provide for us. And it's our responsibility to make sure we do it in order for it to fuel that growth and fuel that capability that the cars have. And when you look at advanced safety, you know, we talk now about level two plus, which is a broad range but the content creation, when you talk about cameras or image sensors, and when you talk about LIDARs, when you talk about ultrasonic, when you talk about all of these applications that have to be packaged together in order to service that need and the use cases that I talk about, one cannot do it without the other. And the opportunity for us between 200 and 1,000, and it's orthogonal to power. Safety is growing. 
even on in internal combustion engines. It's growing. That content is happening. It's happening today. And we are enabling that content, and we are participating, and we are leaders in that content. Now, that content in cars is going to get another boost outside of just the safety, and that's the electrification of the vehicle. The push of electric vehicle is happening. It's happening today, literally today. Uh, a lot of us have heard and saw the article about at least North America today with the push of being 50% electric vehicle by 2030. It is happening. Can't ignore it. However, we can't let it happen without removing all of these gates that prevent it from growing. The governments are requiring it, and OEMs need to invest in it to stay relevant and stay competitive. Everybody's doing it by 2025, 2030. You know, we talk about strength in the market. I'm talking about strength for multi-decades of rollout of these technologies in the market. You want to develop a strategy that is sustainable. You develop a strategy on a mega trend that's going to last decades. And therefore, we're just getting started. If you look at it, we're not going to get to the 50% mark of vehicles sold until 2028 for EVs and any type of EV. So the opportunity is there. I just described the content. The opportunity is going to start growing. Let me give you the, an example of why you know, people talk, oh, well, what about the units? How, do, how much do you think the units of number of cars are going to grow every year? Does it matter? If the units are flat and the penetration of electric vehicle happens and the content created in electric vehicles is what I'm telling you it is, the market with on semi and, uh, and for us in automotive, it's going to grow and it's going to grow above the market. So it's all relative. But the growth is compelling. And the growth is more compelling when you have the breadth of content that you need in electric vehicles. You know, everybody focuses on the traction inverter, yes. That is what makes or breaks a car, electric vehicle. But what about all the other power that I've been talking about, the, the, the joint power with the sensors, the power that you need for your seat? All of that power that is required to get a car sold. You know, I, my, my, my daughter is nine. She got in the car. I have a very old car, 60s car. She got in the car and asked me, how do you open the window? I'm like, it's that little handle here. You can't have a car without electronic content. You need it to be relevant. For, so it's on top of the electrification. And our breadth of product offering and our breadth of technologies and our breadth of packaging from the large to the small is what makes that breadth of product relevant and what makes on semi powerful in this market to capitalize on that growth in the market and let the units do whatever they want, which I believe are gonna grow. The growth is on top of that. Because the breadth is important. Today, 10 years ago, we talked about MOSFETs. Then we talked about IGBT going up the power curve. And now we're talking about silicon carbide. Sure, you can throw a dart and say, I'm only going to do here. Well, let me give you an example. And I hope some of you saw it downstairs. If not, Afterwards, we're open all day. <laughs> Downstairs, customers today, to get that trade-off between cost and efficiency and packaging, have an axle with IGBT and an axle with silicon carbide. So what happens if you don't offer both? And not only that, if you don't competitively and efficiently offer both. They're going to go to somebody who's able to offer both. Because I need it in the same car. Forget about two car models. Same car. Two axles, two different technologies. You need both. And you need to be the best at both. And that is what we are and where our investments are going to keep us, which is in the lead of the power evolution in order for us to not just capitalize on the market, but to allow our customers 
to capitalize on that market and enable their ramps and their transformation to electric vehicles. We're doing it today with silicon and we will keep doing it with silicon carbide. But technology is the foundational. We need the depth. You can't be a traction inverter, power semiconductor is very, very different than an onboard charger. Maybe same power, same density, same, but it's different. It's very different than a 48 volt system that you also need. It is very different than a 12 volt. Pick your difference, it's different. And the ability to be able to scale all of these is a competitive advantage. It is not something that, oh, you know, build it, they will come. It is something required and something fundamental for a company to be able to leverage that and win in the market, and we do. Now, even better, what about scalability? Now you have all the technologies, you have all the packages, you have all the form factor. Well, what happens if you're going from a sedan, 100 kilowatt, to an SUV, 300 kilowatt? Well, if you don't have the scalability, then you're talking about years and years of development between this and that for the same OEM. Where mid-size sedan, and obviously I, I love pictures, but I more importantly love this. The scalability of it, 150, 300. Car, SUV. You want to talk about efficiency? Can you tell the difference? Well, maybe you guys in the front, but it is a, I'll do it in millimeter because I, three millimeter difference. 2x the power, same size. That is efficiency. That is breadth, that is technology, and that's scalability. The same OEM will get the same. The only difference is a plate. Two rows, one row. That is not something you do because you stumble on it. That is something you do because it's fundamental to what customers demand. Now, I did ask for a competitive one or competitor's one, uh, but I couldn't lift it, so I didn't bring it. So you just have to stick with the 300 and the 150 that I brought. That matters. Think about it. These two drive a car and drive an SUV. You couldn't see the delta in a naked eye if I didn't point it out. That is between winning and losing an opportunity is that scalability. You need to be able to win it for the whole gamut of models for the OEM in order to meet the fundamental requirement they have, which is commonality, because electronics and commonality on the drivetrain drive commonality on the onboard charging, drive commonality on the charger. Commonality is efficiency. Maybe not efficiency of technology, but efficiency of deployment, and efficiency of deployment drives the volume that this is going to drive. And when it drives the volume, it drives the content. And you have to keep innovating. You know, of course, I'm excited about what I just showed you, but that is excitement in one point in time, today. We have to keep the investment going. We have to keep that aggressive, in this case, the silicon carbide improvement at a technology level to keep that cost and efficiency and weight curve pushed towards what is capable on a technology level. We need to keep the packaging, the focus on weight on packaging. The more efficient we make the, micro, the, the, the power and the more efficient we make the silicon carbide, the smaller the package could be because it's less power dissipation and weight wins. And on a device level, if you need to do from four switches today and go to two, I don't have to do the math here. 
you have to keep innovating. That is what we do. That is what every person, every engineer at Ansemi does when they wake up in the morning and go to work. It's what we do. And I am very proud to say it is what we do best. And you heard it from some customers. But we don't stop there either. We have to get that intelligence in there. We can get efficiency on a technology level to a certain point where you need to add intelligence and you need to go from power where we talk about the switch, whatever technology and package that switch is with all of its supporting content externally and we have to bring it in. And we have to bring it in through integration and through package development in order for us to be able to squeeze that power efficiency out and by having an intelligence power module be able to detect its own operation and performance and parameters real time and adjust because it cannot fail. And that drives our content more than 750. Between everything I showed you, the content is there. The market is growing. The switch from ICE engines, combustion engines, to electric vehicles is happening. And our content is growing. And we're winning because of the breadth and the power and the intelligence we put in that power. I talked about both and I talked about them being orthogonal. They're not dependent. For us, it's the opportunity. When you look at an ICE engine and a level zero one, you know, most common uh, vehicles, I'm talking about $50 of drivetrain, drivetrain content. Fast forward, 48 volts and level two plus. That content goes up 280, over 5X. Then you get through EVs and all the way to level four and five. But let's not get to four and five. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. Let's talk about where we are today. EVs and level two plus. And we're talking about $750. Now I'm sure a lot of you looked at the bottom and said this is our own addressable content based on our own view of the market. I had the same question and I'm very, very trusting but I like to verify. So I said, go get me one customer that has all of these. And in 2019, same customer, I'm not gonna name them. You just have to take my word for it. Same customer, combustion engine, level one, 130, one. In 19, same customer in 2020, 160. They went up a notch on safety. Same customer, 2022, starting to ramp, 2022, electric vehicle, still level two plus, on shipped content, 715. Now for credibility, there's another customer that didn't have the history and they started XEV and level two plus, $843. And therefore, it's the greater than that I inserted in there. Content is happening today, and On Semi is winning that content today. I don't have to wait 10 years for the safety to be level four and five. It is today. It is happening today. The design wins that we have today are growing and will fuel the trajectory that Thad will talk about. And that is providing us with 30 times more content than we otherwise would in this. A lot of people ask me, well, what's the content multiplier when we get to electric or we get to level two plus, 30X. And that's why I'm comfortable stating that we will grow even if SAR stays flat, which I said, I don't believe it would. Units are growing, our con content is growing, our content is growing 30X. And I'm not waiting two years to say, 
I hope so. I'm saying today, based on today and the ramps that are happening because electric vehicles and automotive safety is happening, the content is growing. My name is Alan Zhen. I'm a VP at the NEO side and a CEO at the XPT, which is a NEO subsidiary. Shape a joyful lifestyle is our mission. To deliver high performance, high value EV product is our challenge. We start working together since year 2017 uh, on ADAS camera product. Recently, the two companies have been engaged on the megapixel uh, CMOS product and also silicon carbide module for the 8 megapixel CMOS on semi product is the first one can meet our program timing which is important range anxiety is still the number one reason for users say no on EV to develop a longer range with affordable price is important in the middle of 2020 we evaluate all the potential solutions in the market. And Semi's product is the best one, which provides us 4% NDC improvement on the range perspective. Silicon carbide module have a longer uh, range, which means high efficiency. Then finally, reduce the CO2. We have been look at the product roadmap to find the opportunity the two companies can work together. When we found the issues, the two uh, engineering teams working closely uh, solve the issue one by one. So those teamwork help us to really move forward on the product development. The China local team uh, every week in our office, so we are really more like a big team working closely. Uh, we never put the Ansemi as a supplier. They come in without notice, so it's more like a come back home. Neo is a young company, a new brand. We cannot afford any kind of market failure. Reliable quality is critical to us. Ansemi's product is a leading position in the market. That's the foundation for us to select uh, Ansemi. They evaluated every product in the market and picked Ansemi. If you didn't believe anything I said so far, you can take that one home. That's why we win. And that's how that ecosystem is interconnected. A bottleneck in one due to technology or investment or anything like that is going to prevent maximizing the value across the rest. So when you take all of these markets and you take that growth and you take all the excitement of kegers and all that stuff and you synthesize them to what does it take to capitalize on all of them. It is the intelligent power and the intelligent sensing and the combination of both are what we strive to have as our new mission in the company. It is through pushing that innovation, that boundary, to maximize that intelligent power and sensing in order to allow our customers to achieve what they need by solving their most complex problems and therefore them achieving their mission. Because it's all interconnected. It is the powering the electrification. It is enabling the experience with our sensing. It is through the industrial evolution that is no longer just machines and open loop. It is with robots and efficiency and high, accurate, reliable, and quality output. And it is through enabling that because Industry 4.0 what we all talk about is what is going to allow all of that content to be built into vehicles. We are at the center of all of this. This is the new on semi. This is it. We start with the people that drive all of these before we even get to all the exciting technology and the capability and what you need and intelligent power, intelligent sensing. There's a layer, which is our teams, some of whom are here. They built 
overnight all that stuff you saw downstairs. And I'm sure they saw it and got a lot of problems and they solved them to see what you saw downstairs in our immersive room. The people enable through our target investments, this power, intelligent power and intelligent sensing. And below that, you have the manufacturing, you'll have the module, you have integration, and more importantly, you have the channel. There is a module, trust me, it just didn't show up. <laughs> but that's what you need. You need the people, you need the technology to back them up, and you need to be able to deploy it to our customers in the breadth and depth of technology, packaging, and pushing the boundary of innovation. But you have to play to win. You don't dabble. You pick your markets or the ecosystem. We pick the technology that maximizes the market. It just happens to overlay on automotive and industrial. Great markets. You just double down and you bet on the technology because I will tell you, I will bet on my team anytime. And I'll bet on them by allowing them to innovate in the markets that we need. And you implement structural changes from where we were in order to deliver on that new one, new strategy. You have to remove complexity. You have to have people innovate. You have to push the boundary. You have to streamline manufacturing. We're no longer a company that has manufacturing and we go run after everything to fill that manufacturing. That is not what we do. We will run after innovation, we will run after technology, and manufacturing is there in order to support. We're turning the historical on-semiconductor table and creating a path for on-semi to deliver on the promise that we're all here making today. and we capture the value. We're not going to be everything for everyone. We're going to be the partner for the disruptors and those who value innovation. And that's how we will deliver on our margin promise. And we will execute. And we will execute the way you saw us execute. I'll take the last two quarters. We have been executing. This is not new. We have a team that is able to execute on a transformation. We have a worldwide team that is able to execute on the technology. And we will deliver what I am talking about here today. And we will reward our employees for it because that is how we are creating and rewarding with shareholder value and customer value creation as well. Now all of this is going to lead to a financial result. <laughs> but I said I brought backup and that backup is for Thad, our CFO, to take and synthesize what this means for us as a new company. What does it all translate to with all the markets? Not if, but when. And that when started two quarters ago. And the results that we're going to sustain and sustain over the next five years will be outlined by Thad. And with that, I'll have Thad go through the financials. We are at the start of an automotive revolution powered by innovative partnerships like Subaru and OnSemi. With sensor technology provided by OnSemi, Subaru is developing life-saving systems like EyeSight Driver Assist technology, enabling vehicles to see the road in every direction to prevent collisions and optimize cruise control efficiency. We are working together to rethink the way we keep drivers safe with Subaru's award-winning driver focus system which keeps its eyes on the driver to alert them when their eyes leave the road for too long. On Semi and Subaru are changing the relationship between car and driver to eliminate human error and save human lives, creating different technology to build an accident-free world and a better future for everyone. 
So, how can we help you build a better future? Subaru and OnSemi. Intelligent technology, better future. All right. Great to see everyone. It is great to be back in person again um, after a year and a half of being out. Um, so it's nice to see everybody face to face. Um, look, you heard from Hassan, you heard from um, our customers, and I'm going to now take that and show you what it means for our financial model and how we're going to create shareholder value um, out of that. I also have a few friends that I brought along as backup as well, so you'll see that as well. So let's, uh, let's jump into this. So um, I think Hassan did a great job of talking about the mega trends in industrial and auto. Those are our focus markets. They'll continue to be our focus markets. Um, we are not dabbling. We are doubling down. The next one is gross margin expansion. We'll go into this deeper, but we've got the manufacturing optimization. We've got a mix, and we've got a portfolio rationalization that we're going through as well. The third one is generating free cash flow. And with this come, becomes a uh, shareholder-friendly allocation model that I'll take you through as well. And the fourth one is a new leadership team that's focused and has an, uh, a history of execution. And you're already seeing it as it's on side. Um, on Monday, we announced record revenue, record earnings, and record free cash flow for the second quarter. So we're seeing early signs of this transformation taking shape, which is great to see early. And then the last one is, as we execute, we're going to drive sustainable results. We're going to take the volatility off the P&L, and I'll walk you through how we're going to do that as well. So let's dig into each one of these. So the first one is the, uh, is, is the revenue growth. We're looking at growing revenue two times the semi-industry. Our fifth generation eDrive technology is based on the design principle of a current excited rotor and therefore requires no materials classified as rare earths. Power semiconductor solutions from OnSemi provide a technical solution behind the scenes to achieve this. They help us fulfill our promise of sustainable electric vehicles. We are also working closely together to make our vehicles safer using image sensing, ultrasonic sensing, spread arrays and power management solutions from OnSemi. We are counting on the performance and high quality of these solutions. All right, so you're starting to see the deep relationships we're having with our customers. So let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the intelligent sensing and intelligent power and the, the market growth we have ahead of us. So starting with 2021, um, if you look at our projections and where we've been so far in the year, we're estimating that we'll finish the year just under $6.6 .6 billion of revenue. And as we look forward to a 2025 target, I'll, I'll walk you through the growth rate here. So we're looking at about a 7 to 9% growth rate over this time horizon. This is 2x the industry. The industry is forecasted to grow 35 to 4% over the same time frame. And if you break down the individual components, starting with the intelligent power, we're growing at 15%. Um, that market, as Asan showed you, is projected to grow. The market rate is 6%. So this is the electrification. This is the factory automation driving that market. On the sensing, we're looking at 13% on intelligent sensing versus a market growth of 10%. So in both cases, we're outgrowing the market. And again, here, um, ADAS, advanced safety, um, autonomous driving, and factory automation driving that as well. And then the last piece... Is, um, is the other pieces of our business, which represent today about 40%. We're looking at that decline, and I'll come back and touch on that in a minute and explain the decline there. But that business is actually very attractive from a cash flow standpoint. So it generates a lot of cash and, uh, and critical to us. You know, it includes some connectiv connectivity and some other products in there. So, but we'll come back to the growth rate on that one in a second here. So let me talk by in market. Auto industrial, as I said, is, are the focus markets. They'll fuel the growth. Again. Starting with 21, it's just under $6.6 .6 billion. We'll step through each one of these. Still got the 7 to 9% growth. Starting with other. So other on the markets here are consumer, compute, communications. Um, in here, we also have our cloud and 5G business. That's forecasted to grow at 11%. So definitely above market there as well. Another growth driver for us. It's in, our, in that bucket. 
On industrial, the industrial is forecasted to grow 7% for us. That's, that's our estimate here. That market overall is growing 4 to 5% over this time horizon. So again, taking market share, outgrowing the market in the industrial side of the house as well. And then on the automotive, growing 17%. Over this time frame, SAR is forecasted to grow low to mid-single digits. So we're growing at 17%. Hassan talked a lot about the electrification and the, the drivers there and the sensors. And so obviously that's a big opportunity for us. Um, today, the auto and industrial represents about 60% of our business. As we go forward, that will move to about 75% by 2025 as we focus on those markets. With that obviously becomes gross margin expansion. I'll come back to that. But it's a, it's a very positive uh, move for us as we see more and more auto and industrial business ramping. So we look at our business in two categories. We look at it as non-core and strategic. Our strategic uh, products are where we're going to double down. We're going to continue to inv uh, invest. And then on our non-core businesses, we'll look to exit that business. And so today in 2021, there's about 25% of our revenue is what we consider non-core. Over this time frame, we're going to exit about half of that, which we consider low margin, uh, highly competitive markets and products that we choose not to play in. So if you think about it from an overall revenue standpoint, it's about 10 to 15% of our, our overall revenue that we'll exit between now and the next couple years. And so that's going to mute our top line a little bit for the next two years in 22 and 23. Now at that same time, although we're going to give on the, the growth rate, we're going to focus on operating margin in, uh, expansion. And I'll come back to that again um, when we talk about gross margin. But you will see a little bit of a muted growth. And then in the outer years, after 23, you're going to see the growth accelerate and then achieve that uh, 7 to 9%. So if we think about our strategic business, it's growing at about 13%. That's the basket of everything else other than non-core. Um, this is where we'll invest 100% of our R&D dollars. And, and we'll, uh, we'll double down there. And then um, that will drive the margin expansion. And then again, you'll see that 7 to 9% growth. Couple years, muted growth, as I said, in 22 and 23, but 10 to 15% will roll off over time here. Then if you think about, we've shown you a lot of videos here with customers and their, uh, their engagement with that. Let's talk a little bit about our customers. So our top 20 customers represent 35% of our revenue. They tend to be highly diversified across all geos, across all products. Um, they tend to be very sticky. We have no 10% customer as well. And because we align on technology roadmaps, we're seeing more and more stickiness with these customers. Um, and then at the same time, we're engaging with our customers on long-term agreements, which gives us better visibility, allows us to plan better and plan our capital allocation and our investments in capacity. And then we also have a channel, a very broad channel. We have about 23 distributors across the globe today. It represents 60% of our revenue today. Um, it is a customer base that's highly diversified and highly profitable for us. So a channel that we want to continue to invest in. Um, it also strengthen, strengthens our presence in the industrial market. This, the industrial market is broad, lots of customers, and we need the distribution channel to, uh, to serve those customers and achieve that growth. So we look at that as a competitive advantage. Then if you look at who we engage with, we're engaging with all the marquee names in our focus markets. And we've got deep engagements with the disruptors. And if we look at our top 20 customers, our top 20 customers on average buy 24 product families from us each. So this is the breadth of our products that we provide multiple solutions to our customer. We're not a one trick pony, we're actually providing a broad range of products to those customers. And Hassan talked about the various aspects of that, that product. So deep relationships, product breadth, strong channel, gives us an advantage over many of our competitors of being able to go to market. So let's do a deep dive on gross margin here. Um, I've talked about the manufacturing consolidation, uh, the optimization and the mix, but let's walk through the drivers here. The execution is going to drive to a 45% gross margin target here for us by 2025. We've done a great job of executing so far, and let's go through the components of it. So 
We're forecasting to end the year right around 38.6%. And how do we get to 45%? Let me walk through the components. So the mix shift, this is shifting more and more to industrial and automotive, as we see 75% of that business uh, being coming in industrial and automotive. More and more of it be becoming more pri proprietary. That helps improve gross margins. Portfolio optimization, I talked about walking away from the 10 to 15% of our business. That will give us a margin bump just by exiting that business. And then the last one, which represents about 50% of the gross margin improvement, is on the manufacturing side here. So this is optimizing our manufacturing, driving efficiency, um, exiting fabs, talking about fab lighter. I'll go deeper here. And that, that's what gets us to the 45%. So, shifting to fab lighter. So we've said we're not fab light, we're not, we're not uh, fabless, we're actually going fab lighter. So if you look at what we've done historically, we've been an, a legacy IDM focusing on fab fillers. We had to chase revenue to fill up the fabs. We were always uh, running to, to catch up to that. We had excess of capacity, so we were investing in capacity before the demand was there, and we had to chase that back to the fab filler capacity. And then we have many subscale fabs today. Um, so through acquisitions and various sources, we've got subscale fabs, footprints very broad. And then as we've invested capital, because of that broad footprint, it's caused a low return on the, the invested capital. So as we think about moving to fab lighter, let's talk about what that means. So the first thing is moving from a fab filler to going more and more uh, flexible manufacturing. This will lower our fixed cost footprint. It drives higher gross margins and it reduces the variability and the volatility on the gross margin line as we move that way. On the excessive uh, capacity, we're going to invest our capital into differentiated products and differentiated solutions. We're not going to invest in common technologies where we can go outside. So we'll flex outside to take advantage of those technologies. Um, and then that gives us a, a, a competitive advantage that we'll continue to uh, benefit from. On the subscale fabs, we'll exit those. There's a cost advantage to that. We'll take fixed cost out. We've got a 300 millimeter fab that we'll continue to invest in. And then on the back end, we'll also provide, uh, we'll go more into a flexible manufacturing back end as well. So today we use about 34% of our back end manufacturing ex is external. By 2025, we think that'll be about 45%. That gives us a cost advantage as well. It gives us that flexibility. As market dynamics change, we can flex inside and outside. And then, as I said, our, we'll optimize our CapEx by really investing in power, um, silicon carbide, into differentiated products. So all of our capacity expansion will be where we differentiate versus common platforms. And that will help us maximize the returns on those investments. So that's our fab lighter manufacturing strategy that we've talked about. Now let me, uh, let me go a little bit deeper into what it means for OnSemi and how we look at it. So if you think about the number of fabs we have today, we've got about 10 fabs around the globe. We've said we're going to exit a couple of them. We publicly said which ones they were. But over this time horizon, we plan on exiting more. So you can see what's going to happen here. Our number of fabs will decrease over time. And as we exit those fabs over this time frame, there's $125 to $150 million of fixed costs that will come off the P&L. And that goes right to gross margin, obviously. So reducing the number of fabs, positive for us. As we think about capacity and the capacity for, um, per factory, that goes up. Now we bring in the 300 millimeter fab in East Fishkill. We get capacity there. And we're reducing the, the subscale fabs. And as we do that and we increase that capacity in those fabs, it actually lowers the unit cost as well. Not, not just taking off the fixed cost, but we actually get a, a cost advantage in the 300 millimeter fab. So capacity for factory goes up. Then if you look at our total capacity, we have the opportunity with this, with this uh, footprint here to increase our capacity 1.3 times. And that will all come in power, um, silicon carbide, in areas that we can differentiate again. And with our engagement with our customers and our long-term agreements that we're putting in place, we can plan much better on the capacity needs multiple years out. And we'll build the capacity based on the demand that we see, based on commitments from our customers, rather than build it and they will come. So this will give us an advantage as well. And again, as I said, be much more capital efficient for the company.
My name is uh, Jake Leach and I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Dexcom. At Dexcom, our mission is to empower people to control diabetes. And we do that through innovative technology, particularly uh, continuous glucose monitors. Uh, it's a unique device that measures glucose continuously and it really allows people to understand uh, how their blood sugar is, is moving and trending and it's the key component of treating diabetes is managing blood sugar. OnSemi is our go-to choice as a vendor because of multiple reasons. The expertise in ASIC design, uh, we don't have in-house designers, we bring our specifications uh, to OnSemi and their engineers design these chips for us. And then also the scale of manufacturing. Uh, being able to manufacture uh, millions of chips at scale for our products is, is key for our ability to scale our, both our business um, and also serve customers. For many years, diabetes has been treated with finger sticks where a patient has to prick their finger and take a drop of blood. With our solution, it measures glucose continuously and does not require any finger sticks. And that's only made possible by the accurate measurement uh, of the electronics inside the CGM solution. One of the significant benefits of our collaboration over time is our ability to continue to integrate our electronics into smaller and smaller packages. At first, many of our components were off the shelf discrete. Um, and as we began designing our first ASICs and then our next follow on generations, we've been able to utilize new technologies, uh, new process nodes to both lower power and reduce the size of the components, uh, as well as reduce the cost. So it's been a significant benefit uh, to our business to be able to act on those things, uh, as well as to our customers who now uh, enjoy smaller products that are more accurate at a lower cost. What we really liked about uh, our working with OnSemi was the ability to collaborate on the solution. Uh, from day one, when we designed those first radios, uh, before the days of Bluetooth uh, to today, where we're integrating Bluetooth technology and analog circuitry for measurement of sensors all into one ASIC. The, the collaboration together uh, has been phenomenal. Uh, over those many years of working together, we've solved many problems, we've brought new technology, uh, and I really look forward to continuing to work with OnSemi in the future. So he talked about integration, packaging, scaling, our new Fab Light strategy will allow us to support and scale with a company like Dexcon. And that's where we'll go as we go forward. Free cash flow, another big focus for the company and will drive shareholder value. We're looking at 20 to 25% free cash flow margin. So if you start with where we are today, we're projected to end the year right around a billion dollars of free cash flow. The, that's 15% free cash flow margin, and we think we can double that by 25, going to roughly $2 billion, and that becomes 20 to 25% free cash flow margin. So it'll be a focus for the company. Um, again, we'll be maximizing the return on the investment of the capital and driving incremental margin. And this shows the leverage in our business model. So we're going to increase our free cash flow at two times the rate of revenue. Again, the leverage in the model. If we start looking at the capital expenditures, which we do have, we're going to invest in the 300 millimeter capabilities, as I talked about, that drives a cost advantage for us. Um, it allows us to consolidate our fabs. We're going to invest in silicon carbide. We'll continue to, to expand our dye, dye capacity and our competitive advantage in modules. Continue to make investments there. Again, we can differentiate in product leadership. And then power and packaging will be the areas. So all of our uh, capex you'll see in these areas uh, going forward. And this will give us a competitive advantage in packaging as well and unique power capabilities. So our capital intensity over the next couple years because of our, our great opportunity ahead of us is about 12% for 22 and 23. And then we'll moderate back down to 9% by 24. So then the next logical question is, so you're gonna create $2 billion of cash, what are you gonna do with it, and how do you, what is your capital allocation strategy? So the first thing we're gonna to continue to do is invest in our organic business for growth. We're gonna uh, invest in product differentiated um, and gross margin accretive products. Um, the, all of the investments will be ROAC based as we think about it, which choices we have. We'll also look at M&A that is adjacent and complementary to what we're doing today, or it accelerates an initiative that we have going on inside, and all of our M&A activities will be accretive to our financial model. 
And then we'll maintain the financial flexibility to support both of those initiatives above. Um, our target leverage ratio on a net basis will be one and a half to two times. And we plan on maintaining our current credit ratings as is. And then with the excess uh, cash flow, we're going to take 50% of our free cash flow and return it to shareholders in the form of share repurchases. So a strong uh, return of capital policy going forward over the long term. So let's talk about sustainable results. I've showed you a lot of good numbers there, but how do you do it consistently? So our operating margin, again, was going to grow two times uh, the revenue growth. And again, the, the leverage in the model is highlighted there. In order to drive that, there's a number of things that we've got to drive. So we're going to focus on profitable growth. We're decoupling the gross margin from revenue. We're going to achieve our gross margin regardless of revenue. Um, we're going to exit volatile and highly competitive markets to take that, uh, that drag on the, the gross margin off. We've got long-term service agreements that give us better visibility with our customers to plan our capacity and our capital allocation. The Fab Light strategy reduces the volatility on the P&L in terms of gross margin and investments. And then we'll have tight cost controls across the company. So we'll actually invest in, in OpEx significantly behind the revenue growth. So that'll give us an opportunity there. And then our R&D will be in product leadership in areas that we can generate high returns. And by doing that, we believe we'll be able to have more sustainable and consistent results in good markets and bad markets. And that obviously drives shareholder value as well. So the 25 target model, I've hit on a few of them. We'll walk through it. But let me start with where we are in 21. I've, I've touched on a few of these. I said we'd close the year just under $6, .6 billion in revenue. Our gross margin is 38.6, is estimated to be there. Operating expenses are coming in around 19%. And CapEx intensity is at about 8% today. And our free cash flow margin is roughly 15%. So as we look forward into 25 and we look about what we can do here, we've talked about the 7 and 9% CAGR, growing two times the semiconductor industry. Gross margin at a 45% target. This is the uh, optimization of our manufacturing, the mix, the portfolio optimization. OPEX, about 17%. And as I mentioned, it'll grow slower than revenue and lag revenue growth. And that'll give us operating margins of 28%, and that's growing two times uh, the rate of revenue growth. CapEx will be 9%, and as I said, the next couple of years will be a little bit higher at about 12% as we're investing in, in the 300 millimeter fab and silicon carbine and power technologies. And then our free cash flow is at 20 to 25%, and we'd be generating $2 billion of cash in 2025. So we talk about sustainable results. We've also got to do our part, and we're going to be climate responsible as we go through this. Over the last couple of years, we've won a lot of awards on, as we focused on sustainability and ESG. Uh, ISS has rated us prime in our ESG uh, um, activities. Barron's rated us in the top 10 for the most sustainable companies in the U.S., and over the last six years, we've won, we've won consecutively being a part of the world's most ethical companies. So it's in our DNA, it's in our culture to, to drive sustainability. Our customers are doing it, we're doing it as well. We're doing it because it's the right thing to do. And because it's the right thing to do, as we go forward, we're committing to being net zero by 2040. Again, it's the right thing to do. So we believe what this will do, not only by driving um, what's right for the environment, it drives alignment with our customers. Our customers are asking for it, our employees are asking for it, and this drives tight alignment. And you'll see it by here, by listening to the customers here. The end customer will be able to see a product which is very reliable and robust, but far more important is the energy saving, the energy consumption. So the energy bill will be far lower. The CO2 reduction will be significant. Silicon carbide module have a longer uh, range, which means high efficiency. Then finally, reduce the CO2. Autonomous vehicles powered by an amazing platform, an efficient platform, 
will help the world both conserve energy, help save lives as they improve safety, and, and provide better convenience. The biggest thing that any company can do is figuring out how do we have less impact on the globe? How do we use less of the natural resources? And for infrastructure, power consumption is the key. Nokia's aspiration is to design products that leave the world in a better place for our children and our children's children. And OnSemi is part of that solution. All right, and so just to bring it home, I'm going to end with the same, same slide that Hassan ended with. He talked about playing to win. He talked about implementing structural changes, capturing value, and executing. And we think all of this together drives shareholder value. With that, we're going to open it up to uh, Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, microphones around. So just for everybody on the webcast, I appreciate if uh, you speak with the mic, and then we'll go through there. All right, go ahead. Hi, guys. Uh, thanks for hosting the day. And Hassan, those are some amazing shoes. I love them. <laughs> They're comfortable. <laughs> Tons of swag. Um, uh, I, I guess I don't even know where to start here, but uh, maybe I'll start with uh, incremental gross margin. Uh, previously, we were thinking, uh, the last management team was thinking there was a 50% fall through. Um, but now with your long-term model at 45%, um, and it seems like you're structurally moving to a higher gross margin uh, and markets here. I was wondering if you could um, potentially give us an update there. And just secondly, uh, maybe for Hassan, you guys are walking away from 10 to 15 percent of revenue. Um, have you gone to these customers? I, I assume the first move here would be to raise prices. Uh, and have you talked to these customers about? Uh, prices, uh, price increases, and is it your belief that they that they will um, uh, that they won't take those those price increases? And so, is that why? I, I guess what are the details around the ten to fifteen percent that you think you're going to lose? Have you already gone to them with 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 price increases? Let's start with that. Yes, yeah, start with the gross margin. Okay, so on the gross margin, like I, I don't think about it as fall through because as we right size that manufacturing and shrinking that, it's a different, a different scenario than what it has been historically, where we look at every dollar that would fall through. Um, as we shrink, the cost structure changes drastically. So what we actually look at is the, the contribution margin of every incremental dollar in terms of just product cost and product margin on it rather than uh, fall through. So what we're more focused on is the, um, is the ability to drive sustainable long-term margins on every product we sell versus you know, quantifying that in a fall-through. Again, we'll right-size the manufacturing to, foot, to, to fit the size of the company, and then from there, we'll continue to grow. So I don't look at it as we're having to chase that revenue and what's that incremental dollar going to do. It actually could be much higher in some cases. Yeah, because that's, yeah, I echo that. I mean, that's the argument of moving away from you know, what I called over on the call the fab filler. When you're chasing that, how do you do it? You just keep pumping revenue, and that's not the model we're going. Uh, for the next question you, you asked, as far as have those been communicated, the answer is yes, uh, in multiple ways. Some are we can't support it today. You know, it's, it's a good environment to be in in order to accelerate a lot of these decisions. And when I say accelerate, it's, there's growth in all areas of our business, including you know, the gray bar, the, the you know, 25% of the bit. It's all growing. What we're having to make choices today and communicating those choices to the customers are we can't scale all of them. So what we're doing is we're reducing capacity, therefore forcing that decline and moving that capacity today to where the growth is not just this year, but in that strategic product that Thad showed. We're fueling that growth today because of the environment and accelerating it. Therefore, we're taking away from 
I would call it the, the, the legacy or the non-core businesses. And those are our intent to have been communicated. The latency between making the decision and fully executing it, you know, Thad talked about a two year, is there's migration that we need to do. You know, we're also a, 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 you know, there's an ease of doing business component of it. Some of those customers we supply other things to, and therefore you can't just say, effective tomorrow, we will no longer ship. So there is a transition and that transition is already ongoing. And as we, they either ramp a different product from us or they ramp a different product from somebody else if we don't have that product as far as value driven product uh, delivery, then we'll part ways. We'll keep focusing on the strategic, they will go somewhere else, but it's that transition that we are in to now. And that will take between one and two years depending on the customer and also depending on the market recovers. Hey guys. That was running in the back, yeah. Gary Mobley, Wells Fargo Securities. Thanks for hosting this event, very informative. I wanted to start off by asking Tad about the target. So 2025 target, seven to 9% compounding your growth for us to try to figure out what that magical revenue threshold is. But is that from a base that is 10 to 15% lower from 2021 and then from there, seven to 9% growth? And then for uh, Hassan, the China EV market's critically important for any US-based semiconductor company. But it is largely, uh, I guess, internally sourced. Uh, in particular, with Sanon expanding its silicon carbide capacity and having a state-of-the-art manufacturing facility, it seems like they're very content with their own supply chain. So how difficult is it going to be for you to tap into that market? Thank you. Yeah, so let me start with the, um, the baseline of the 7 to 9% growth. So the 7 to 9 is off of our 21 projections, which is just less than $6.6 .6 billion, which includes the roll-off of the 10, 10 to 15%. So if you think about what I showed on the strategic products growing 13%, they're actually going to grow much faster in the short term to offset the decline that we're going to see as that business rolls off on the 10 to 15% over the next two years. Yeah, as far as trying to look... Uh Today, we're, y your question is about silicon carbide, but let me abstract out of that. Every three, five years, that same question could have been asked about any whatever technology was the new technology that's upcoming. So I'll answer it that way. There's one way, and it's not about China or Europe or, or North America even. It's about it is our responsibility to invest in value in order to stay ahead. And therefore, providing the value is not a decision, well, oh, I wake up today and I want to do silicon carbide. We know what it takes to do silicon carbide. But I hope I, I, I showed and I explained that it's not just the device. It is the technology is one thing, the breadth, the portfolio, the packaging. There's a lot of investment, but more importantly, a lot of innovation that has to happen. That's our pedigree. That's where we came from because of the IGBT position we have. We're going to contain, continue that, that push in order to maintain that leadership and capitalize on the silicon carbide conversion as, as customers introduce it, whether in one axle or two, as, as I uh, explained. So it's not about somebody deciding to do it because it could be anybody. If we don't keep pushing that envelope, it doesn't matter who you're going to lose to. Uh, first, you're going to lose on margin, which is not something you heard from, from Thad and our uh, direction is not something we are going to let happen. Uh, and second, you're going to lose on competition, you know, efficiency. So we have to maintain both. We're going to keep both. Uh, and I welcome, you know, whoever's going to decide. And you saw from the backup I brought uh, where the Chinese customers are with on semi. And these are not you know, legacy, they're new disruptors. So just look at where they are betting their power infrastructure today, even with all the news that you highlight. So I'm, I'm very comfortable in our ability. However, you have to keep innovating. You have to keep shrinking that, that. You have to keep reducing that weight. You have to keep pushing that boundary in order to always get that last range for the customer. That's how you win. Hey, Tad, Tad and Hassan, good to see you guys again uh, in person and great show here. I had a, I had two questions. Um, Tad, you made a very interesting statement that you expect to achieve 45% gross margin regardless of the revenue growth. Um, 
so if I was to dream the dream and say that we get revenue growth on top of your ability to achieve 45%, in case of dreaming the dream, do I wake up at 45% or do I keep going after that? <laughs> that was the first one. God won for Asana. <laughs> Look, you know, we've got a we've got a path to get to 45. You've you've seen us execute over the last couple quarters. Um, we've said all along this is a journey. It's not going to be a step function getting to 45. We also said it's not going to be a, a, a hockey stick in the last couple of years. Um, we have a path to get there. We'll continue to execute it. We'll right size our manufacturing to to the growth of the company. Right now we're we're projected at seven to nine percent. We'll get to 45 percent, and then we'll talk about it more after that. Fair enough. Um, and for Hassan, I think you highlighted two themes as the key themes, power and sensing. Could you tell us what the basic fundamental gross margin range for those products are in power and sensing? Uh, look, it's not uh, the gross margin obviously varies just like any, any, any company where you have uh, some above uh, your uh, corporate uh, target, some below the corporate target. And as a company, you, you get there. Uh, it's not about uh, the power and the sensing, you know, there's that breadth below it, whether it's by market or by technology or by generation of technology. Uh, that's what we're focusing on. So I'm looking at the blended has to be accretive. Now, forward looking investments, you know, back to how we make decisions on the R&D dollars and how we invest them, that's going to be more driving into that accretive margin. Uh, you know, I mentioned multiple times uh, since, since I joined the company where one of the one of the biggest uh, pleasant surprises I got is when I looked at the distribution of, of revenue. It is not a tight distribution around the, uh, uh, the corporate margin, whatever the corporate margin was at the time. It was a pretty wide distribution, which allows us to start shifting that mix even as we stand here today. And you saw the results of that. So mix shift is going to be one and new product is going to be the other. But we are going to shift the mix. We're going to do the manufacturing. You know, all these are what I call self-help. That's why they're disconnected from uh, the, the top line, because that's a shift in the mix as you grow that mix. And then growth will come on top of that, and we have to make sure, and that's our responsibility on the R&D uh, allocation, of putting that growth with new products now accretive to that margin target that we want. So over the, the run, you know, again, the 45 will be you know, the milestone. Vivek? Oh. Thanks very much uh, for the presentations. I actually had uh, two or three kind of clarifications. Uh, first, I appreciate you gave us a you know, 25 uh, vision. Um, you know, for better or worse, we often focus on, on the nearer term than that. Um, and I think, Thad, you mentioned uh, that the growth in 22 or 23 might be muted. We understand those are kind of the transformation years. So if you could just give us some bookends on how we should be thinking about sales growth uh, and free cash flow in calendar 22 or 23, to the extent you could you know, give us some, some range around that so we can calibrate our models. And then I had a follow up for Hassan. Yeah, on that one, for 22 and 23, as I said, I, I think we're going to grow at market. Right? We're not going to outgrow the market as we will in 23, 24, and 25. Um, so I would look at, you know, you tell me what the market's going to do, and I'll tell, you, I'll tell you where we're going to come in there. But I think that's, you know, we should be pegged in the market as we roll off that 10 to 15% of non-core. Got it. Next thing is, um, Asan, when I look at a lot of your competitors, um, right, especially the, the ones in Europe, uh, they also have uh, microcontroller uh, portfolios, right? And some of those microcontroller portfolios, I assume you know very well. Um, does one need to have a breadth across power and across micros to be successful in the automotive market? Do you think just staying on the power side is sufficient for you uh, to achieve your targets uh, in this market? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So if, if you look at the efficiency, that is the first question that is asked. If efficiency is equal, then the bomb coverage is the next thing that uh, customer look at is, okay, you have the power because that is the make or break from the value that they provide. You know, our customers provide to their customers, whether it's range, weight, or cost. If the efficiency is there, then you go to the next level, which is breadth of the bill of material and breadth of the portfolio. Can I engage with on semi on here, and I got these 200 other parts that I need to engage on, how much of that can I get, not just on a system? So that, that's the main one. Now. I'll say efficiency is not the same. 
So we have that competitive advantage. So the rest of it doesn't matter because they don't get to the next level. And the fact that we're able to do the maximum coverage of the bomb based on the breadth and the depth of our offering is a very sustainable and a sticky model. So we're gonna keep that and keep that efficiency. So it doesn't get to the next one. From a, however, I'll answer it also from a system level perspective. At a system level, you see in those systems, they're liquid cooled right? Whatever liquid the, the customer decides, but they're liquid cooled and they're high power density. A microcontroller does not live in that environment. It is, the microcontroller is a different module and therefore the bomb or the integration or the cross-selling is not as critical or critical enough to supersede the efficiency. You'd lose way more on the efficiency than a, you know, $3 microcontroller. Uh, so that's not, a, uh, that's not a make or break for the strategy. The strategy is sound, and we stress tested it based on that. Got it. And, and Vivek, I'm, I'm sorry, sure. but um, I missed the second part of your question. I just wanted to clarify on that as well. You asked about cash flow and operating margins. So as the top line is muted in 22 and 23, we'll be focused on operating margin expansion, and we still believe during that time frame we can keep our free cash flow margins in the mid-teens. Got it. Thanks very much. Hi guys, over here, Ross Seymour from DB. One question for Hassan, one question for Thad. Hassan, somewhat pivoting off of what Vivek just had asked, how does cyclicality come into this equation for you? What if revenue growth is not seven to nine percent? We've heard big kagers for content gains from a lot of companies over the years, and if you look far enough out, it, it happens. But in the meantime, we have a lot of volatility in this industry. So what happens if the 7 to 9% doesn't occur? How does your business model adjust to that? Is it more variable now? So the, as Thad just said, some of the margins can still come through. Talk a little bit about that scenario. Sure. Uh, so if you look at you know, the, the answer I gave earlier is the mix shift and the self-help are what's going to reduce that volatility. So the comment you know, where you're tying, and a lot of companies do that, is you have to grow at that rate. You have to reach X billion dollars or X top line in order to achieve your model. Well, we're disconnecting it from there. The growth that we have, even on the growth, without winning the new designs, the growth fundamental that is ramping even today is growth. So the mix shift is going to happen. Of course, we will look at what the market is doing as we resize our manufacturing, where I said the strategy is going to fuel the manufacturing. But that increase that expansion is based on self-help uh, because designing products today if you think about it in the automotive market that's not going to generate till you know think about it three year uh, design cycle if we just launch today you're talking about three years uh, so we are basing our, uh, our our push on the products we already have legacy is going away or the non-core is going away and then we're going to push on what we already have ramping. And we're just gonna do it very effectively and reduce the volatility because of the manufacturing footprint. Those are what's going to help disconnect that from the market. And that's why we did it relative to the market. Whatever the market does, we're gonna adjust, but there's fundamental growth going there. And the drive of EVs is happening. And I said, you know, it may not happen, you know, like the graph shows over the next 10 years, but even just penetration of EV and no more cars made, that will give us the growth. Because the content that you have to look at is that 30X, and the 30X is based on what we have today. Uh, and that's why I wanted the credibility of showing what a customer is shipping today from 19, 20, and 22, and that acceleration that's happening. And then the quick follow-up for Thad, off of that same variable business model, you talked about lowering the volatility of the gross margin side. If this last cycle was, call it, 30 to 38% gross margins roughly. Where do you think the new floor is? 45 is great. I don't know if you want to call that the ceiling or not, but it's a great target. But how high does the floor come up as well? Because I think that consistency is something that's been lacking over the last number of years. Yeah, you know, I, I talked about the initiatives we're taking to reduce that volatility. Um, you know, the midpoint of our guidance for Q3 is at 40%. We're hoping that becomes the floor. We hope that, you know, in all market conditions, we maintain a four handle. Who's got the mic? Hey, Hassan. Um, thank you for the presentations today. I'm wondering if you could give us an update on uh, where your silicon carbide revenues are these days. I think the last time on provided an update, um, you guys were 
kind of meaningful behind kind of the leaders in the space. It sounds like going forward, uh, you sound very confident about securing new wins. Uh, you talked about efficiencies. I assume your competitors are also focusing on efficiency. So I'm wondering if you could just talk more specifically about what you see going forward that's going to allow you to close the gap there. Uh, sure. Uh, look, we when I when I joined the company, uh, and I think I've been very vocal about this. One of the biggest thing I'm bullish about is our posture in silicon carbide. I know where the company uh, uh, came from, but I know that there was dabbling versus doubling down. Over the last uh, call it seven months, we have doubled down. Uh, over the last seven months, we have secured designs, the disrupt disruptive designs that are going to help fuel, not all, but a lot of that growth that you're seeing and offsetting some of the mix shift that we talked about. Uh, we're now breaking up the silicon carbide. I look at it as overall power uh, because it is a mix and it's going to grow. Uh, both are growing while the mix is happening between the IGBT and the silicon carbide. Uh, but I remain bullish on where we are. I remain bullish because I went to customers virtually <laughs> and I asked, if I'm doubling down, why are we winning? Because what I didn't want, while well, you're winning because you're the cheapest one in town. Uh, that's not value. That doesn't help me get to the margin that we need. We're winning because of efficiency. We are winning because of the capability. And we are being selected because they evaluated all of them. Not on PowerPoint, not on, you know, I see those charts, comp, competitor A, competitor B, and it's always a green dot where your column is, no matter who you are, and you just replace the logo. Uh, you didn't see any of that here because I don't have to show it. The customers told you, just like they told me, we get selected because of efficiency. So yes, the competition, I'm sure, is working to catch up on our latest generation that we have used to win those long-term agreements that I referred to, and those will start ramping. They're starting to ramp this year. You're going to see it ramp next year, and so on and so forth. They're working on efficiency, but so are we. And that's where we keep pushing the boundary with those you know, two-digit reductions, whether it's on technology or on packaging. So I'm bullish. Uh, I'm bullish because of firsthand what I've seen, firsthand conversations I've had, and really the long-term engagements that we have with a lot of those customers uh, over that period of time. Hey guys, it's uh, John Pitch with Credit Suisse. Thanks for the presentation. C couple of follow-up questions. Hassan, maybe another way to ask the silicon carbide question. When you look at your intelligent power versus your intelligent sensing over that time frame. You're significantly outgrowing in the power market. You're still outgrowing in the sensing market, by a, but by a, a little bit less. How important or what's, what will silicon carbide be in 2025 as a percent of your power in that sort of uh, framework you gave us? Why is the outgrowth in sensing not as strong? Is it just because you're so dominant today in CMOS inhibit sensors? And, and I guess, how does LIDAR play in to the outgrowth? And then I have a follow-up for that on, on, on the uh, financials. Sure. Uh, so we're not. I'm not break. I'm not breaking out the silicon carbide at this at this point for a lot of the obvious reasons. Some of it is competitive, uh, but I will tell you it is fueling a lot of the growth because we have a very good position. IGBT. The same comment I'll give you on on the sensing. Uh, so the growth is there, and the growth for power is not just on electric vehicles. We have. You know, I, I think in the first quarter uh, uh, earnings, I talked about the charging and the infrastructure. We have been in with the disruptors, and now they're starting to ramp. So we're seeing silicon carbide uh, within that ecosystem. Now, of course, the, the ecosystem is not the, the fueling of the growth that the automotive would do as it converts, uh, but there's growth across the whole, the whole gamut, whether it's charging, onboard charging, or uh, the traction. That's going to be a bigger growth driver in the power, you know, within the power, but I'm not breaking it out as far as percent where we're going to land. On the sensing, you're absolutely correct. Uh, we are today, you know, about a 60% uh, on, on the imaging. So we're getting a lot of that deployment. You know, think about between six and 12 cameras. Obviously, the uh, robo taxi is 28. So there's a lot of that market share that we already have today. So that's going to be uh, not not million, but 13%. I'll take it every any day, right? Now the lidar is growing, but there's that latency between now and when lidar becomes meaningful. We have LiDAR designs that are uh, at the end of this year through 22. So that's starting. And with automotive, it's going to keep growing. And that's going to fuel a little bit more. It's 
you know, if you look at the two, higher than the 13 versus lower. But we have a very good position today. Our latest uh, LiDAR that I showed here from the packaging, but also the capability. Uh, Russ, 300 meter? 300 meter plus. That distance, that's part of the efficiency in small package. That's why we have one and that's ramping and we're gonna keep accelerating that innovation and also that design and uh, engine as we get through the next few years. And then that as a follow-up maybe to Ross's question just on the financial model, is there any cushion built into that model which assumes that perhaps the entire industry is just over earning in this year and so your starting point is somewhat inflated? And I think I understand that even if that's true, the gross margin leverage is still there, but how should we think about kind of your investment levels if that revenue growth isn't as strong? Are you still gonna to have to invest in OPEX and CAPEX at the rate that model would imply independent of revenue or is there flexibility there? Oh, it's definitely flexible. I mean, we'll, we'll flex it with the revenue growth, right? And because we have the long-term agreements with many customers, we're seeing, we've got better visibility of what that revenue growth looks like. And obviously, we'll, you know, we're taking kind of a risk-based approach to this. We'll evaluate that, but if, if we're not seeing that revenue growth come through, we can definitely throttle back our CapEx investments as well. And that's the, important, uh, the importance with the Fab Lighter is the ability to do that where you don't have all that fixed cost that you have to absorb. Uh, so having that fixed cost go down, but the capacity going up to fuel the growth, you already got rid of the fixed uh, capacity, or the fixed cost, but the capacity is growing. So if it grows one, you know, 1 1.3 or 1.2 or 1.1, that we can flex as long as we can support the growth without having the downside, you know, back to the floor. And then back to the 21 being perhaps an above trend year for everyone, or are you, at all embedding that into the model? Sure, we've definitely contemplated that, right? Looking at what next year would look like. Um, you know, look, we think we've made structural changes inside the company that are sustainable, but we have definitely taken um, a hard look at that and accounted for that in our model, especially in the short term next year. Oh, hey, thanks guys. It's Chris, don't call me Charles Danley. Um, given all the you know, <laughs> shortages and hullabaloo as to what's happened in the automotive uh, food chain, Hassan, going forward, do you think that you know, the, the entire food chain is going to carry a higher level of inventory than existed two or three years ago? Or what, what sort of structural changes do you see to the automotive food chain, especially as it pertains to semis? And then I had just a quick follow-up. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good question because we are seeing a shift. But uh, inventory doesn't solve it because... The next question is, well, who is going to carry the inventory, right? Uh, us or the middle or the DC and so on. It's not going to be solved with just carrying inventory. It's going to be cushioned by having the inventory because the latency is still very large. The latency from starting to supplying. The conversation now is different. Our conversation now is strategic. And when I say strategic, it goes into, the again, the long-term agreement where uh, not the long-term agreement to keep people on the hook. It's a long-term agreement to share a much deeper level of road mapping and a much tighter coupling of design between products and end product, you know, our products and end products. And, you know, it goes back on, on the efficiency. When you have been engaged with a customer, it's not off the shelf. When you have engagement with the customer where their design makes or breaks based on the delivery of your technology versus anything else, that will start the design in much ahead of time. And then the milestones are from you know, cancellation to visibility to uh, uh, committed volume two years from now because we have to build the capacity back you know, to John's uh, point where when you start seeing that as you approach, then you start making those throttle investment versus let's build all the capacity on hope and then you can't anymore. All of that is all of the multitude of approaches that we're doing with the customer, which are very different. And I say very different because in 2018, the same thing happened. And it hasn't been three years yet, and we're still in it. So the solution is structural. Inventory is just containment, but the structural is what we're working on with the, uh, not just the tier ones, but with the OEMs. So the OEMs are now taking a much more active role on selection and uh, uh, business continuity planning for their tier ones and with us. So it's a three party and sometimes it's a two party, us and the OEM. That is different, fundamentally different. Yep. And if you look at your product portfolio and the growth areas of automotive and industrial, 
Are there any products out there that you don't have that you see um, other, otherwise that, that you might like or are the customers asking for anything additionally that you don't have product-wise? From a product, uh, no. I think, I think we have a very good coverage. Uh, you know, there may be some pockets where we don't have a product, but the way we analyze those is, is that important over the next five years or is that something on the you know, in, internal combustion engine where it's going to wind down? Not a problem. We're not going to engage. Uh, for the intelligent, we have the capability today to make any product. Uh, and for the, call, I'm going to call it the value discretes, like silicon carbide and IGBT, we have the capability to keep pushing that technology. So it's all in execution. Thank you. Oh, over there. Hi, guys. It's uh, Toshi Ahari from Goldman Sachs. Uh, thank you very much for hosting um, the analyst day. Uh, I had two as well. Um, the 10 to 15% of your revenue that you're looking to, to I suppose, exit, um, as you reviewed the portfolio, how did you go about kind of drawing the line and, and how did you determine that 10 to 15%? I think some of us were thinking that number could potentially be, be, be bigger coming into this event. I'm just curious, you know, what, what some of the criteria was um, as you made that decision. Sure. The, the biggest and most weighing was uh, the strategy. Uh, when, you, when we decide to go after uh, power and sensing in the markets that I uh, talked about in the way that I talked about, uh, that was the first kind of level. Then, so it has to be under that umbrella. Then you go is, what is our posture competitive? You know, back to the efficiency. Are we best in class? Or are we just dabbling and we just have something and the only way we're gonna win is on price, therefore margin. Uh, if we're not adding value, that goes in that bucket as well. Or we have a roadmap to fix that value, then it stays. So it's very, very surgical is how we did it. Now there are uh, products that were dragged down by the volatility of the margin. Uh, and therefore, they will have the uplift by the part of the mix, you know, reducing cost, fundamentally and structurally reducing cost, does the margin uplift, we're doing that. Especially if they, we are competitive in the technology, not competitive on cost, we're fixing the cost before we throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, so very surgical, and that's where it landed. Uh, there's still work to do, obviously, to shift that and make the improvement on the cost. You know, you hear me talk about thousands of line item, gross margin improvement. That's all part of that, but it's all contemplated on coming out of it. Are we competitive? Are we sticky? And are we providing value that we can translate into gross margin expansion? That is the high level criteria, but it has to be synergistic with our market and our strategy. Um, thank you. And then one quick follow up. I guess as you both sat down with with your team, you know the leaders of of Onsemi, and you know went through the process of molding your strategy. Where was the debate? Was there any pushback from the team? Any part of the strategy where there was disagreement, if you will? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, look, that was not disagreement, but there were heated conversations. <laughs> but there's alignment, uh, and the conversation were. And some of them, I was pushing to keep a product because I believed in the position and the team said, well, you know, if we really want to be strict about it, this is this got to go. Uh, so that gave me also the confidence that the team is looking at it from the same lens that I am versus, you know, being anchored in a, in a different uh, uh, assumption. Uh, so there there was a healthy debate. There was a healthy debate on how quickly we can move products that are not potentially performing to performing. Uh, and then we aligned and we move forward. Right now, you can't deliver results like we did in the first quarter and the second quarter at the pace we did if we didn't have 100% full alignment at the executive staff, but way more important, everybody in the company. You can't, it's just, it's impossible. I can talk about all I want, about margin expansion and so on, and somebody can quote something or ship something and that I wouldn't even know about until, <laughs> until it's too late. That is how I measure alignment. So yeah, debate is part of what we do every day. Arguing is part of what we do. Alignment is where we need to land and execution is what we do. Here. Great, thanks for taking my question. It's Will Stein from Truist. Um, I'd like to ask about the uh, fab lighter strategy, and it seems like that 
derives from one of the points up here about aligning uh, manufacturing with the strategy of the business, right? Thinking perhaps intellectual property first as opposed to fab first and then filling it, right? Um, so it's really two separate questions. Uh, on the one hand, does the current environment of pretty meaningful shortages and extending lead times, does that influence this decision and perhaps keep around a bit more manufacturing than you would have otherwise uh, decided? And then the, the sort of flip side of that is you're still keeping certainly the 300 millimeter facility. Perhaps there are others. Maybe you can go through a little bit of this decision making with us uh, to help us understand, you know, if it's a, if it's a good idea to outsource more, you know, wh you know, why are you, I almost want to ask, why are you keeping anything? Sure. Uh, look, the, where we are today is obviously a factor because we can't be blind to where we are today. However, this strategy has to sustain the next five years. You know, I can't flip flop every time the market changes. So therefore, credibility of the strategy and stress testing of the strategy is important. Uh, I'm not talking about reducing capacity. You have to separate the two. We're talking about reducing the uh, uh, fixed cost because capacity is actually going up between the 300 millimeter and, and what we're doing on the other fabs of streamlining manufacturing. We're able to support the growth. Uh, now, why don't we do more or why do we have any? Well, that's a simple question. Uh, the answer is there are technologies that don't have foundry. You know, name one place credible that I can go out and get silicon carbide manufactured. Device, not, I'm not, I'm talking about functional, you know, device uh, level that I can just take as a die and package. Uh, there aren't. Now, there are other technologies we do, like mixed signal uh, analog that have foundries. We're going to use those and you go outside, so we don't have to build that capacity. We're going to keep some of that capacity inside, but flex outside. We're not going to build capacity to expand those where we can go outside. But there are technologies that do not have foundries. So the answer is deciding to go with the power says you can't go fabless. That's why I want to make sure fabless and 100% are the two extremes. You can argue today we are fab light. We want to be fab lighter to say we are going to be moving away from the fixed cost. And the decisions, if I looked at a lot of our fabs and you look at just the cost, fully loaded, forget about underloading, overloading and so on. When I absorb all of the fixed costs, can that fab achieve the cost structure that we need? And that's a very big decision for us, or a weighing decision to make sure which fab is going to perform or not. Subscale, you can't get to the cost structure because the overhead cost or the fixed cost is too high. I think we have time for a few more questions. Thanks, uh, Hassan, and, uh, Hassan and Thad, for a good presentation there. In the interest of time, I won't ask you what your 1960s hobby car is, but <laughs> just on the EV and ADAS side, I was wondering, you mentioned almost 30x increase in content. What's the mix of EV and ADAS today, and how do you, where do you see that in 2025? Then I have a follow-up. Mix between EV and, and ADAS. I guess I can just point to the mix of uh, sensing and power. That's kind of, it's a good gauge. Uh, do you know today? I, I don't know. Yeah, I think that's a good proxy, though. That, that would be the proxy I'd give you, but I don't have that number on top of my head between power and sensing, kind of the 21 expected. Got it. Uh, we'll, we'll, I'll follow up with that. Okay, no worries. And, and uh, just uh, talking about renewables and ESG, uh, I know on the demo side you had uh, a bunch of demos on, on uh, solar power and infrastructure. Um, just wondering what mix... What is that mixed now, and how do you see that growing uh, as you look out to? Thanks. Yeah, that's going to be part of the, the uh, growth that we see, you know, part of the industrial that, that uh, you have in the 7%, where, you know, we think industrial is going to be, you know, the usual industrial GDP plus. So a lot of that extra that you see for our growth in the, the 7% is going to be fueled by a lot of the renewable en uh, uh, energy and infrastructure deployment. So renewable energy and the consumption side. 
uh, the manufacturing of Industry 4.0 is going to see growth, but that's, I mean, we all know that, that growth. is a lot of replenishing and changing the uh, capacity and the throughput, so that's going to be nice and steady. But the bigger drivers within those are the distribution and uh, the renewable. Renewable is, I would say, accelerating because it started earlier. The charging is going to be in tandem with the EV uh, penetration. So that's going to be more in tandem, and that's in the future years, as you saw in the penetration of EVs and the chart I get. Over the next few years, that would become more and more meaningful. But today, it's more on you know, the solar and the arrays and, and the uh, generation versus the deployment. Where are you at? Okay. Hey, good afternoon, guys. Harlan, sir, JP Morgan. Um, the team's leadership in image sensors and your SPAD products for LiDAR in auto and industrial, these are going to be a big part of driving that 13% Kager in intelligence sensing. Today, all of your image sensor and maybe even your SPAD products are outsourced. So just given the importance of this product and technology portfolio, portfolio any, any plans to bring some of this manufacturing in-house and over what period of time? Uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> I don't want to get into a lot of the detail, but there are some areas where it makes sense because of die area and cost structure, where in order to support our growth, you don't want to sustain external uh, cost structure, those we are bringing in. Uh, where we are with that is, let me look at Russ, that's public, right? Okay. We have an imager with an inside fab that's taking pictures and getting qualified right now. <laughs> Didn't want to steal his thunder. Uh, but yes, that's obviously back to Thad's point. We're only going to invest where we see we can add value. In this area, it's not about technology. It's about specific roadmap item, like he said, where we add value if we do it inside. But it's not 100% inside. Because what I don't want is I don't want to do everything inside. I want to have to be able to do inside, but as it grows and it will grow, you're able to do inside and out. And that's the flex by getting the cost uh, advantage but not getting all of the fixed costs to sustain that market fluctuation that may or may not happen. Thank you. I'm right. do one last question. All right, one. All right. Go ahead. Thanks. Uh, Chris Castle from Raymond James. Um, uh, two questions. So first, if you could help us with the, some of the timing of the different elements you, you spoke about with, with the gross margin improvement. Uh, on the earnings call, you talked about it, some of the mix effects were, were accelerated. Uh, uh, because of the market environment, how much of that is still left. I'd presume that some of the benefit from exiting the non-core products probably happen as, as that occurs, which you said over the next two years. And then on manufacturing, which I, I guess is the biggest part from here, um, when will you be able to achieve that? Because obviously that takes some time for qualifications and such. Yeah, so the mix in the portfolio optimization is happening now. Um, we think over the next two years, we'll take care of the, the portfolio optimization. Mix will kind of happen naturally with that as well. The manufacturing is always the long pole in the tent, obviously. It takes uh, years to exit fab. So, you know, as we think about our strategy to go fab lighter, we engage with a partner, we've got to exit that fab. Now, what we're planning today is we're planning those exits. So we're working with customers and qualifications. We're doing our work to move out of those fabs but it is a multi-year process. So you can think about that, that piece of gross margin, which I said is about 50% of our improvement as being over you know, the, the course of the four years. That's the hardest one to get. It's just, it's blocking and tackling, it just takes time. Great, thank you. Um, as, as a follow-up, Hassan, just in, in terms of uh, on the auto market, and you, know, you spoke of this, and I think we understand, it's, it's about three-year uh, design cycle for that product. So. Um, you know, given this is a four-year uh, 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 horizon that we're talking about, you know, how much um, uh, of what you're doing now can be realized within that, you know, recognizing just the design cycles, that, that some of the, the efforts that you're hoping to capitalize on over the next three years had to be done previously? Uh, yeah, so obviously new products will be in the tail end of that, that uh, window that we talked about, but we didn't start now. Uh, you know, the companies had, the teams have been winning and engaging in these markets uh, with products that, you know, I would say are new products today that are ramping. You know, when I talked about the, the energy distribution, the charger uh, design ways that we've talked about, when I talk about EVs, 
already that are ramping, and you heard from, from some of the customers today, those have been designed already. Uh, it goes back to the distribution I talked about. When I walked into the door, the first thing I said is show me the distribution, because that was the Achilles heel. If it's tight, you know, <laughs> we wouldn't be having this meeting. But it wasn't tight, it was, it was very broad. So therefore, there is value in a lot of the products and a lot of technologies we provide and have been providing even before I showed up. The difference is, let's double down on those in order to make sure we're able to run them at that level over that period of time while we add more new products to it. Uh, so it's not something we're gonna start today, it's something we have been and we're gonna keep doing it and we're gonna focus on it and do it better. All right, well, thank you again. Uh, the room downstairs is, is, is still open. If you wanna uh, mingle, have a social, we'll be down there. So I would, would love to uh, do a lot more of the chatting if you're available, but Thad and I will be down there and I thank you all for coming in person and uh, for everybody on, on uh, the WebEx, I thank you also. Thank you.